Thank you, Marian, and thank you, department, for the opportunity to talk about my work. Uh, in this talk, uh, I intend to give some fundamental ideas concerning the quaternionic quantum mechanics because it is a quite there are few people working in this subject at this time. So my proposal here is just talk about some foundations of the subject. Some people will probably find that it's too elementary, but that is the idea. And I will present uh, as an example a work that I have published concerning the relativistic case. So, the program for today is considered first a conceptual introduction, which I will give some very general ideas. I will present quaternion numbers, which is not so well known to the physicists. I will introduce quaternion quantum mechanics, which is summarized in a book of other and at the end I will consider the Dirac equation considering quaternions and that will be my example. So and finally I will round off this uh, talk with some conclusions. So Now I want so just to give some general ideas. The first, do physics, physics influence mathematics? So, if you know this book, Milton Simon, Mathematical Methods in Modern Mod, Methods of Modern Mathematical Physics, a quite classical book of mathematical physics. If you read the preface of this book, the authors will say that yes, physics influences mathematics. And the reason is that uh, physics is a source of problems and mathematicians study these problems in a mathematical way. And that's the, the influence of physics in mathematics. But they also ask if do mathematics influence physics? So, they do not give a good answer to this question, and I don't know if someone has this answer. Uh, my opinion is that if you consider mathematics only uh, as a language or as a tool for physics, the question may be rephrased as, can a tool influence a worker? or the language can influence a uh, philosopher, some, some kind of uh, question may be stated. So, but if you consider mathematics as a method, maybe we can understand the role of mathematics and physics. And my opinion, my personal opinion, we can discuss about this, is that if we consider a method, they do can uh, provide influence in physics because the most readable method may help to discover new physics. And so, in this research, we ask, can we discover new physics introducing a new mathematical structure which is the Quaternion numbers. That's the question of my interest in this subject. So, uh, quaternion numbers, uh, for people who don't know it, they are uh, generalized complex numbers. We can see the first line that we we can uh, have a pointer or Oh. Thank you. So, 
This is a quaternion number. It is a complex number. We can call it a hyper complex number. It has three unitary units, i, j, and k. Square they give minus one. It can be written as a sum of two complex numbers, z and zeta, multiplied by this j. This is the symplectic notation. So, if I multiply here, I get this extended notation. So, uh, you can ask why we have three uh, complex units. Why not two or five or anyway? There is a theorem which proves that there are just four division algebras. This means that if you have a product of two numbers equal to zero, either A or B is equal to zero. If you have, for example, more or less uh, complex units, uh, this equation might have uh, neither is zero. For example, there is a sedanium number which have more than, uh, I believe, 15 complex units because we have the complexes, then the quaternions, and then the octonions, which have seven complex units. So they have seven real degrees of freedom. The quaternion have four degrees of freedom, real degrees of freedom. So my idea using this all the relations, but all the complex units are anti-commutative. So we can obtain this from this line, but... <laughs> okay. So, uh, the theorem of Hurwitz, which I have mentioned, states that just four are the division algebras. The other, which have more uh, complex units, is the octonions. So they have seven, and they are uh, the octonions are not uh, associative. So quaternion numbers are not commutative. So the order of the product is important. So this is the reason is of course the anti-commutative character of the complex units. So, and the octonions are non-commutative and also non-associative. But I am not interested now in, in octonions. We are just working with uh, quaternions. And what? Some properties, they are non-commutative, they are associative. Um, they have a complex conjugate as any complex number. We can define also a norm of the uh, quaternions. So, and a reference which explains some basic facts about quaternions may be found in this article of John Bayes, the octonions. This is about octonions, but they have much material about um, the quaternions may be written in a matrix form, which is this, and these are the Pauli matrices of quantum mechanics. So if you write this, you obtain a matrix form of quaternions. Um, 
some facts also. Uh, the quaternions are used, for example, in programming for rotations. They are the people who work with uh, programming computers to graphical uh, purposes use these formalisms to rotate objects. I don't know much more about this object than uh, just mentioned. And mathematically, quaternions are the even part of a Clifford algebra. So the more general uh, theory about quaternions is the Clifford algebra. So, uh, but I will not hear discuss more about Clifford objects. I will just use the simple factors I have stated. So, um, now I will talk something about quaternionic quantum mechanics. This is a subject which uh, many informations may be found in this book of uh, Stephen Adler. It is today also almost an old fashioned quantum mechanics book. So, in and other uh, inside this book, many of the material concerning the research researchers in quaternionic quantum mechanics. So, the idea is we know that quantum mechanics uses complex wave functions. So, the question is, may we generalize quantum mechanics using a quaternionic wave function? That's the question. It seems to be a good idea because uh, what can we receive with this change? So, as you remember, quaternions have more degrees of freedom. So, may imagine that this more general object have more capability to describe uh, a, a wider range of subjects. That's the idea. The, at least what I understand. Quaternionic quantum mechanics is a way to introduce degrees of freedom in quantum mechanics. That's the idea. So, but uh, it's not so simple to implement this idea. And for example, if you remember Schrodinger equation, which I write here, you remember that this simple equation. But if you just change this complex wave function to a quaternionic wave function, you have uh, some kind of ordering problem. The problem is clearly this I multiplies here. It can be on the right, on the left, or on the right the, of this term. In Adler's book, he tries to uh, solve this problem using anti-Hermitian uh, Operators. We see that if we have a complex uh, Hermitian operator, uh, we take the complex conjugates and the order of H and I change. So the complex conjugate of I is minus I, the sign can commute because it's a, a real factor. But if this is quaternionic, this is not equal uh, minus minus high is uh, uh, in a complex case. This is intermediate. Because we have this property, the complex conjugate, is minus 
this and these pipes. It's simple. But in the case of quaternionic Hamiltonians, this is not works because the, the complex conjugates change the order. It's what I have written here. So this is not uh, uh, intermittent, just multiply the Hamiltonian by I. If you just change the Hamiltonian to intermittent in quantum mechanics, this is not a problem. The question is that you will have not an, a real uh, spectrum. You have a pure imaginary spectrum. So we just multiply your spectrum by i. It's just a, a matter of a factor of i. Yes. No, it is. The, the question is, uh, this is not the energy. This is, you will not generate an energy spectrum. You will have I times this. So it's not a problem because it's just a matter of a, uh, a factor. So we can have observables using quantum mechanics, uh, using intermediate operators. Of course, imagine if you have this Schrodinger equation. It does not change the, the the physical content of the equation. You just multiply by a factor. But if you consider uh, this operator, it is intermediate. So you formulate the quantum mechanics in terms of intermediate operators, but it's not uh, a problem. But in uh, Quaternionic case, this is maybe a problem. And for example, you will have some difficulties to, for example, obtain uh, probability curves. There are some ambiguities which you have to consider if you want to, let me say, uh, introduce everything which is in com complex case to the quaternionic case. If you want to copy and just write uh, quaternionic theory which have all the structures of the complex case it's, it may be difficult because of these subjects so yes yes it, it, there's not to do uh, you are talking about uh, non-commutative field theory for example because in that case, we will have, for example, this kind of, of commutation relation. It's equal to theta, something like that. Yeah, uh, but in this case, the anti-commutativity is between the coordinates of the space. No, no. So, uh, I have some ideas about this matter of the anti-Hermitian Hamiltonian. I don't think it must be so, but there are just ideas which I am studying now, but I will not consider here. I just want to say that this is a, a choice.
which kind of history. Sure, sure, sure. That's the reason, that's the point. The question which I am interested, interested in is which kind of phenomena may be described? Sure, sure, sure. but uh, I, I think that is uh, interesting. And my idea is really uh, understand if this may have some utility or to describe nature or not. At this point, we cannot say that this is useful to describe nature. That's the reason. That's the point. So, and that's the reason we, which explains why there are, as now, few people working in the subject. We can compare this Quaternionic theory with, for example, string theory. It's also a very mathematical theory. Uh, there are quite few physical predictions. So, and we go back to the idea of the, the seminar. Uh, can mathematics have an influence in physics? That's also the idea. And when we start uh, our research, we don't know who the <laughs> Okay. So, uh, quaternionic wave functions imply more degrees of freedom, but they also imply, for example, more constraints. The question is, if we have, for example, this Schrodinger equation, and if we try to solve this equation for quaternions, we will have uh, two complex equations. We will have one if we write this kind of wave function, we will have one equation for psi and the other for chi. And for example, the constraints which uh, concerns, uh, for example, boundary conditions of the uh, free equation, you have also uh, more constraints. So, my point is, although we have more degrees of freedom in the wave function, have also more constraints. So the result is that this uh, theory might be not so flexible. The question is, I will talk something about that, but it's more difficult to understand the non-relativistic things. That's the reason that I studied the relativistic things. I will talk something about this. But, so the, the question which you are uh, using is very important because, uh, for example, what is the Quaternionic harmonic oscillator. We don't have a, an answer to this question. So, uh, we can also ask if uh, complex quantum mechanics is recovered from quaternionic quantum mechanics. 
The question is, if we have just a simple solution, for example, and we make this term equal to zero, is this psi uh, a solution of the complex case? Yes or no? I will show you an example which shows that it must not be so. There are some solutions which you take this limit going to zero and you have not the complex case again. So the point is that this quaternionic theory is something different from quantum mechanics. You can draw a simple schema. For example, they are not, they are uh, intersection region, but they have solutions which are not connected. So, in other book, there are many formal uh, theory, but there are quite few examples. That's the main problem of this subject. It's quite difficult to find new solutions, and that's what I'm trying to... So, what I'm talking in this slide is what I have to do. Uh, is this limit a solution? Does quaternionic quantum mechanics contains the complex quantum mechanics? Uh, I believe that's not. If we just take the limit on the equation, we will recover. Simple. But the constraints of this equation are not included in the equation. Uh, sorry. Not always, that's the question. That's the question. Uh, uh, the question is, which phenomena may be described? It can be considered a solution looking for a problem. It can be considered a solution looking for a problem. A problem which have a physical interpretation, because there is a lot of mathematics to know. And one important problem of this uh, quaternionic theory is concerning the Aronfest theorem. You remember that the classical limits of quantum mechanics is governed, described. theorem. Remember that the expectation value of the momentum in quantum mechanics this is equal. But in the formulation of quaternionic quantum mechanics of Adler, this is not equal. So the classical limit is not It's not understood. It's a very important point. It's a very serious problem to have a, a physical interpretation. If you, you use the others' formulas, we will have this relation. You have a commutator including momentum and potential. Because if you have a quaternionic potential, this is this here, uh, but it does not commute. Uh, the commutation between these quantities is important in quantum mechanics, but here, yeah. so, I will give you an example. 
surname, uh, uh, quaternionic Dirac equation. As you remember, Dirac equation is just a first order differential equation. It's not like a Schrodinger equation which have a second derivative space. So I have written this equation. You remember that there is not a, an i here. We have multiplied for i, and this operator is uh, undetermined. This is the potential term, which is written in this form. You remember that if you have the, the usual uh, Dirac equation, this is the let me say the real potential, but here it's written multiplied by i, so but it's, it's not a problem. This form of the potential was just written in order to generalize it. Okay, so we have if we don't have this v1 and v2, if they go to zero, we have back. The uh, use of Dirac equation with V0, the uh, real potential. Okay? So, this equation has a, a, a well behaved limit. We can write this in this form. And this is wrong, this is J. So, have this to remember these matrices and we will solve it for a very simple case which is a, a step potential which we can just write this so the positive Region we have a, a constant value, for example, the real case. And in this region, negative, the potential is zero. So it's a very simple case. And the solution to the complex case is very simple. And we remember that the solutions to the Dirac equation are normally free particles. So we can write this solution. And this is a spin. It's not a, a constant. Okay. So the proposal of, all, of our article was just to change this object a quaternionic object. If you remember the case of complex quantum mechanics, uh, we can understand why it's difficult to find some simple solutions. Because if we take a, a, a non-relativistic solution and just change this constant, it does, uh, we do not necessarily have a new solution. Because uh, you remember that the expectation value will not change. But <laughs> there is a hope we can obtain from a complex case change just the constant uh, geometric phase which uh, is related for example the Aharonov bomb effect. I would like to talk about the subject which is the, the Barry phase and remember that if you change for example a wave function 
uh, face. You can have some some effect which is related to this face. Normally, this would not generate a new solution it is because it's just a constant. But if you study, for example, the Aharonov bomb effect, we will have that this face may have a, a, a expectation. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So, indeed. I believe that we can obtain new solutions to complex quantum mechanics, changing this, this uh, normalizing constant. But this is something which is not studied now. So, uh, okay. So, let's go back to our problem. We have the Dirac equation and the solution which we have just these new constants. And we will investigate which kind of spinners are generated. Okay. So, uh, if we put this wave function here and separate the two parts, you have two equations. They may be decoupled, so we have just simple uh, eigenvalue equations. I have just written here the matrices in terms of its components. Of course, here we have to the unit matrix. And we just calculate the determinants and obtain the eigenvalues in terms of these relations. You see, just from these equations, just these relations, that if we go back to the complex case where W0 goes to 0, remember that uh, the potential which I have written This uh, 1 plus i v2 equal the norm of it is this w0. So this w0 is just the, the radius of the norm of the pure quaternionic term. So if it goes to 0, it will recover in principle the complex case. So we see that. Just looking at these quantities, you see that if this goes to zero, uh, you have two possibilities. And in the complex case, we have just one possibility. For example, this Q plus is not in the complex case. Imagine, for example, we have just idea we have here the, the energy let's suppose that this is the energy which is greater than the potential if the particle goes from this region to this we expect that the momentum will uh, diminish okay but we have this possibility where when the particle go from this region to this, the momentum increases. And this possibility is not the complex case. So we can interpret this problem you can understand this or you you can understand that this particle has some kind of charge. So, for example, if you consider this potential as an electric potential, which is opposed to the motion of the particle, 
for example, an electron. We can consider that this Q plus solution involves an antiparticle with the opposite charge. So, if the particle goes to this region and the electric field is decreasing its velocity, its momentum, if the charge is changed, the opposite situation will happen. So, we can consider that have some different antiparticle solutions, just looking at these quantities. We remember that in case of, for example, this Q minus is use of complex case. So, the momentum in this region is diminished by this P0. We have, of course, this is the energy of the particle in the region. This will uh, give the velocity on the moment. And, but it's possible that uh, the difference here uh, is small and so we have a, a negative sign for this quantity. Okay? So, if we have a, a negative sign here, we have a real explanation. So, it can... Uh, it is a... So, uh, Yes, the decay, the decaying process. It's an evanescent solution. Okay. So, uh, in the usual case, we have three regions. Okay, this is the usual solutions of the Dirac equation. We have the diffusion zone where the energy is here, is greater. We can have a tunneling zone, where the energy of the particle is lower than the potential. And if the potential is very high compared to the energy of the particle, we have a third region, where it's known the Klein zone, where you can find antiparticles. Potential is too high, you can uh, interpret this uh, second uh, move back to this. The fact that you have, you have two regions of, of uh, positive solutions here because of the two signs. Okay, so. These three regions are exist also in the complex case. Okay, so it's not a product of quaternion. So we have the diffusion zone where the particle propagates, a tunneling zone, and the Klein zone which have antiparticles. Okay. So the effect of the quaternionic potential. Uh, this uh, character of the solutions may be measured in this difference between, for example, the diffusion and the tunneling zone. In the complex case, this is a constant quantity. But in the uh, quaternionic case, it's not. This value can change. So, in this figure, we, we can see what happens to the, to the range of the tunneling zone. For example, if we take a constant value of this potential, 
but before uh, what is this line here in this circle we expect that the energy of the particles uh, the, is always greater or equal to the mass of the particle we does not uh, expect that the energy of the particle is smaller than the mass so that's the reason which we choose this uh, quantity so inside this region here this term is equal to the mass so outside here we have the Klein zone okay because the the potential are high okay so if we choose for example a constant value to the, the w0 and vary v0 we see that the, the range of the doubling zone increases if we uh, turn the potential the complex potential higher and that's what we expect okay and on the other hand if we keep this potential constant and vary this w0 we have the opposite effect okay. so w0 may uh, uh, diminish this delta e Okay, this simple uh, figure is just to show that W0 and V0 have some different characters. And another study which we can do is to calculate the velocity of the particle, which is just this quantity, is the derivative of the momentum. The energy and from the, our previous knowledge we expect that v0 will decelerate particles and generate antiparticles that's the expectation which comes from the Klein interpretation and on the other uh, hand we expect that w0 will generate particles if it's high enough and you decelerate on the particles. So, if we consider the velocity of V plus, which involves the Q plus moment, which is always positive, so this is a thing which I have not explained. Q plus is always positive. This solution is not in the complex case. So there is no tunneling zone. And in the, in the complex case, there is always a tunneling zone. So we see, for example, if these numbers of the velocity, for example, uh, the number one is the higher possible velocity the velocity of light so we see from this that if we keep a constant value of w0 and go increasing v0 the velocity of this particle increases okay so we increase this and the velocity of the particle also increases on the other hand if we keep a constant value for v0 we see that if we increase w0, the velocity of this antiparticle decreases. So the effects of this potentials are changed. Now, um, I have some the same analysis to the case of the uh, y minus. 
which have three zones. First, uh, this is the tunneling zone, there is no propagation. Inside this region, we have the diffuse zone. So, the particle is propagating here. We see that if we keep a constant value of W0 and we increase W0, the velocity decreases. Okay, okay this is correct if we interpret this as a particle and we increase this potential, we expect that the velocity decreases. What we are seeing. And this region here is the blind region. We have high potentials. And the energy of the particle is slower. So, if we keep a constant value here, and we increase here, the velocity increases. So, uh, what we see is that uh, this potential increases antiparticles. So, our interpretation is good. In the case of W0, it's not so easy to understand because we see that, uh, for example, if we keep a, a constant value here, the, the behavior of the particle is not so, so easy to understand. So we can see that the velocity may increase and decrease also here. So, uh, you can understand that, in fact, we have particles and particles, but its behavior is not so well defined in our studies. To you the, the explicit solutions. Psi minus, psi plus. In this case, we have this.
Foundation. If it is big enough, we can change the side of the or we can freeze out the solution where this momentum is equal to zero. So we could have some curious properties. things are related, this quaternionic Heisenberg equation uh, is closely related to the Ehrenberg theorem fast theorem and to the classical limit. So this is a very important subject which I'm thinking about it. And also when we are talking about uh, antiparticles, we have to concern also quantum field theories which describes them. Okay, this is what I have today. Thank you. She's not. I don't know if we can explain a better decay process. Maybe it's possible. The question is, uh, we can use this formalism to unify uh, particles and antiparticles. That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> this is a, also a future direction, which I'm not thinking about it, but I know if we have uh, solutions with antiparticles interpretation, why not? We cannot use this formalist to unify this physical phenomenon. Maybe, maybe it's possible, it's a direction. But uh, in fact, I don't know. And in Adler's book, there is also no answer to this, this subject. This book, as I told you, are only concerned with formal questions of the so he writes very beautiful uh, equations and it's interesting which, uh, for example, he considers a uh, harmonic oscillator and he just uh, writes the equations and does not give the solution. So it's difficult to do physics without interpretation of the solutions. This is a big difference, for example, in, in the case of a, a mathematical point of view of an equation. Because the mathematician do not need to see a solution to understand what's happening. And the physicists want to see a solution. The mathematician just understand the properties of the equation and see the unicity, what kind of solution 
if you find a solution, which properties it will have. But the physicist needs to see a solution to predict something for real. And the work of other is concerned with just these mathematical ideas. And not only uh, the question of which is a, a fragile point of the of the Adler's book is which kind of uh, axioms he assumes. For example, the uh, intermediate operators. I don't know if you must have this condition. This is a, a mathematical constraint to the theory, but maybe you don't need, don't need it, and you can study some kind of quaternionic theory without this position of intermediate operators. For example, this quaternionic uh, equation with the couple two complex equations. So, if I understand what you are asking to me, we have, for example, up here uh, this kind of equation schematically. So, we have this. We have here uh, a zero plus h one times j and plus psi plus chi j, and we will have uh, a complex which is and this is the way I solve. For example, if we write a quaternion C plus do you mean here a, a U1 symmetry, okay? And for example here a, another U1 symmetry or not. Because this is cons No, 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 it, it is different because you, you are talking about a non-commutative geometry, which is the Cohen, okay, and this is, uh, the, the case of uh, Cohen uh, concerns this kind of non-commutative. No, no, the question is that the non-commutativity is here concerning the core. Yeah, and so, what I'm 
what to do. The real is that if this was true in this case, we would have some kind of non commutativity here. Okay? This, if we have here, is a complex number, and also this is also a complex number. And they are commutative. Okay? If we have uh, a, a complex geometry, they will, would be not commutative. And they are too. But the, the only non commutativity comes from this object and uh, the other uh, units, i, j, k. They are non commutative. Only they. The coordinates are also commutative. That's the reason which uh, th this is not. Uh, uh, Isomorph to a uh, uh, non commutative field theory, for example. You, you can have, if you want, another non commutative theory. I have written uh, an article considering some kind of problem. If you have, for example, a quaternionic field theory, which you have two non commutativities, the commutativity is coming from quaternions. And also the non commutativity coming from coordinates. I have studied some kind of uh, scalar field theory, and we discover with these two kinds of non commutativities, we will have a non associative theory. I can show you this article if you want. But so in this particular problem, is more complicated because we have junior commutativity which will result in a theory which is non associative. Now, the question is, is, is this. Uh, this non commutative of uh, the points of the space time, uh, it, it covers all the space time. I don't think so. I, I cannot give you a, a precise answer to this. But I believe that uh, the non commutative geometry of Cohen does not contain this quaternion theory. 